I'm Roland Hearn and this is a walk in the garden. Today I'm actually going to go and interview my daughter. Uh, she's about a half an hour away from here uh, and she is doing the thing that she loves most in the world and you'll find out when we get there. Uh, but I want to invite you to come and uh, I explore uh, some of these ideas, particularly the idea of love and worth being two sides of the same coin. So let's go, shall we? Not far from here, just around this corner, I think. There it is. Quite a walk. I think I found her. I think that's her over there. Hello. Who's this? Hello, Ari. You're a good girl, aren't you? Well, this is a beautiful spot, Tyler, for Ari. Yes. She's a beautiful horse, isn't she? Yes. She's much happier now that she gets to be a horse. She's at this absolutely beautiful countryside, isn't it? Yes, and she has her own herd now. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And um, you were telling me about the Bond Mare. Um, we'll probably her see her a bit. Her pair bond, yeah, that's right, <laughs> pair bond. That was the word to use, yeah. So what's the deal with that? So horses are one of the only uh, species of the equid family that um, not only do they have a herd unit that they um, follow around, but they within that herd they each pair off into um, two pairs, and they generally pick another horse that's a similar age and um, oh, sex okay. to them. And then they basically just are partners for life and they watch over each other when they sleep oh. and um, so they become BFFs. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> Tyler's my daughter and uh, I'm very, very proud of her. Um, how old are you now? 25. 25. And you've been, you've been working with horses on and off now for how long? Working's a loose term, right. but I've been <laughs> dealing horses. with horses since I was eight. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. right. One of the things that, as you know, is that I have this little YouTube thing that I do called A Walk in the Garden, mm -hmm. and it's about, it's about me trying to express the things that I've learned across the years about how love and worth um, create a context where people can become their very best. It's not only true for people, is it? That, that when you when you love someone you, and you show them value, that's how they understand that you love them. And we were talking about that, but but you pointed out that it's not only true for people mm. that you've seen the same thing um, with um, horses, particularly. Yeah, and I think that even if um, if we want to approach it more from like a biological perspective, it just makes sense in terms of evolving as a social species. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to live within a, a unified group, you have to create affiliative or um, bonds based off connection and friendly interactions um, in order to know that you have each other's back and you're there to protect each other. And so all of that is based in that love. Right, um, that right. How they interact with each right. other. And so, um, yeah, it makes sense to, to extend extend that same idea to animals when they form very similar social structures to right. humans. And so the thing for me that I've tried to do across the years is, is say that... Um, you, you know what love is because the recipient of the love feels valuable. So people mm. can say, I love you, but unless the person receiving that um, feels valuable, mm. they don't necessarily interpret that as love, right? Mm. But because you love animals so much, you did a degree in what? Wildlife science, yeah. You were trying to get a, a foundation in wildlife science, yeah. um, basically just to understand animals um, better. Yeah. You've also done certificates and things in what sort of stuff there have um, you done? Yes, yeah, so I did also study a certificate for in captive animals and then a diploma in equine psychology and um, a qualification in applied equine behavior analysis. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and I think because with animals, the tricky thing is that because you can't, um, you can't communicate love verbally right um, and so you can't ask them if they feel loved right. um, and valued and so it all has to be based off of consistent application of your interactions with them right so in order to do that you have to understand their behavior right. and, and you're back to back to university again now aren't you yes yeah and what are you studying now um a bachelor of science with a major in psychology and then a minor in neuroscience and marine biology all right yeah one of the things that um i've discovered just in this last um, year is how applicable 
human-based psychotherapies are to animals. Okay, yeah. cool. As you've worked with animals and your studies have helped you to understand what causes animals to feel valued, and obviously a big part of that's feeling safe and feeling protected and feeling mm. fed and all of those um, things, but in all of that is also this idea that the person with working with them cares for them. Um, now, typically, if you're going to train a horse, um, that's not always the way people go about training horses, is it? Sometimes no. they use other methods like... Yes. The equine industry is founded on a lot of conventional wisdom um, based off of like anecdotal evidence, just like personal experiences and old fallacies and false beliefs. and So things like dominance theory, uh, where they think that horses rank each other in a herd um, mm -hmm. through the act of dominance so the most dominant one gets to be the leader and then it goes down a linear pecking order like it would um, with chickens um, so you're saying that's not the way it is no oh, okay. <laughs> no um, so horses so there's been a, a couple of quite long-term conclusive studies so there was um, a five-year one by Joel Berger looking at feral horses in the USA. Then you have Heather Simpson who did a seven-year-long PhD study in Africa. And then there was uh, Italian researchers did um, a study in Italy looking at three different feral groups there. And basically they all found very similar results that um, there is no alpha female, like, there's no alpha male, there is no, um, there is a stallion, but he's not necessarily the leader. Um, he doesn't do, in fact, he does very little leading. Mm -hmm. He's just there for protection and vigilance and obviously reproduction. Um, and in fact, when the herd moves, he is actually at the back guarding oh, okay. um, the back of the horses. And if any falls struggle, then he's there to help move them along. But somebody else is leading. Yeah, so they actually, um, so these studies found that um, all of the horses in the herd can and do lead at some oh, point okay. in time. Um, and horses lead through departure. So they simply just, if they need a resource that isn't available, they leave the herd to go find it and the herd then decides if that like so say it was Ari's agreeing with yeah <laughs> so say it was like a lactating mare that who needed some water then the rest of the herd might be like oh yeah she's lactating we don't need this grass as much as she needs water so then they all move oh, off okay, together right, okay. um so but when we apply it to training a lot of people apply this need to move the horse's feet and be um, dominating them and showing your strength through controlling of their movements um, but that's not how horses move each other. They simply just leave. Okay, and then the others right. Follow, okay, which is right. Very different to how we train them. <laughs> right. Okay. So then, your idea, or the idea that you have been working with now for for a little while, um, uh, is that you follow that method the other horses use. Mm -hmm. You 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 basically show them what you what you want to do. Is that is that what it is? Or yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess so. For me, um, with trying to, I can't be. A, different species they're never going to look at us as right, um, you're okay. my leader so I'm never going to be Ari's leader right. but I can show leadership qualities okay. um, and in order to show leadership qualities I need to know what she views as a leader okay um, so that's uh, an individual who creates a safe space promotes harmonious environment and affiliative interactions um, that I create a safe foundation for her to explore the world from um, so when we look at attachment theory and horses um, and the early attachments that they make with each other. So obviously the first one is with mum, and the whole purpose of that is that she creates that safe space for the foal to explore the world from. So when we train them, it's about sort of establishing that same form of attachment through being that safe space for them to explore the world. So that's making everything as positive as possible, not punishing, getting it wrong, um, and never asking her to do anything through any sort of agonistic or um, negative methods right you know, like it's, okay. it's all about creating that affiliative bond so that she sees me as somebody who um, can protect her in the form of crises and um and makes her feel safe and makes her feel um uh good enough to explore the world and um but also i do aim to give her the life skills that she needs to also protect herself okay um so and a lot of that comes from not controlling her but giving right. her autonomy so okay and um cool. and showing her other ways to protect herself from a threat that doesn't involve running away from the threat and then that gives her the confidence to be able to deal with anything that comes her way and be right. able to problem solve um, that without running off. <laughs> right. So it's it's not just that um, um, Ari, in a few minutes you're going to show us some of the things that, that Ari does, mm -hmm. but it's not just that Ari's a good horse. You you've How, how long have you had Ari? Um, 
about maybe a year and 10 months. So okay. Almost a year. Okay. Um, but when you got her, uh, she wasn't, she, she wasn't even broken in, was she? No. So is broken in a good term to you? <laughs> um, it's, it's a very old term. Right. Yeah, yeah. I do try to steer more towards saying, um, starting them on the saddle. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. So when I got her, she, you could catch her if you had a carrot and you could put her in a float, uh, quite easily. And that was pretty much it. Right, so okay. you can pick up her feet, you can rug her, you can Lunch, uh, right. Um, ride it. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, you couldn't even, you couldn't ride it. That was that's probably yeah. what most people have horses they want to ride them. Yeah. yeah. When you had Ari, you weren't as aware of all of this training mm. process as what you are now, right? Yeah. So yeah. it's been a journey for you um, with her too. You, you now, if I remember right, and you need to tell me the story because I'm not sure <laughs> I do, but she wasn't really really responsive when you first started trying to train her, right? Yeah. So. Um, when I got her, I was still very much um, leaning on conventional training methods and I very much was still like a traditionalist in that manner of using what's called negative reinforcement, which most people would know as pressure and release. It's the mm -hmm. same thing you would use with your dog when they're on the lead and you pull them back to get them. And then when they're standing by your side, you then release the pressure and that reinforces them to stand by your side. So most horses are trained with pressure and release um, or negative reinforcement um, and then what's also termed positive punishment. Um, which we would more just know as um, corporal punishment. Right. So just your classic add an aversive to reduce the likelihood of behavior taking place. So um, even though I've always considered myself um, gentle with horses and always sort of leaning more towards um, softer approaches, I still uh, had my beliefs very much um, grounded in a lot of those old, um, old fallacies and, and, and old ideas of horse behavior. And the horse that I had before her, who I started under saddle, um, in it took about three months from the time that I purchased him, broke him in, and then sold him. Um, and when he was sold, you know, I was able to jump him bareback and canter him bareback, and I was riding him on busy roads with trucks roaring past, and there was no issue. And so that traditional method um, worked for me in that instance. Um, and so I never questioned it mm -hmm. then. And then all of a sudden, I get another horse um, where it didn't work. And also, I mean, I look back on him and I just think. I mean, imagine how much better he could have been with, him, yeah, with yeah. if I actually understood him. Um, but yeah, so Ari, there was nothing that I could do to engage her social um, system, like her, her, her connection system. And, and you know, we got places, like progress was made. Mm -hmm. It was super slow. And after like five or six months, you know, I still didn't have a saddle on her. I still couldn't pick up her feet. And I was feeling very deflated. And was kind of starting to question everything and um and so i just decided to stop mm -hmm. i said I'm, I'm not gonna uh i'm not gonna train her anymore um i was even at the point of almost selling her because i just i just thought i wasn't good enough to right. um to deal with that, that kind of um really uh anxious nervous um rambunctious horse um that she is she has a very high flight response which is out of a place of fear right um, from from negative experiences with people in the past and um and yeah and so i just decided to i wasn't going to train her but i was just going to go and spend time with her without any expectations on her and i started just taking her um on trails just in hand on the lead just walking her like as if she was a dog and mm -hmm. um and we did that for probably three months where we just walked together and ran together and ate together just out on the trails and it was that very um I mean at the time I didn't think a lot of it um but looking back I know that that was the thing that started breaking down her walls right, because right. that was me interacting with her in a way that was so natural to what aligns with her um ethogram or her natural expression of behaviors right. and um and so through that process she started slowly letting down her walls and I thought um you know like I'm just gonna try so before I had quit the training, um, I still could barely even look at her back legs without her trying to kick out at me. Like right, if you've even right. made any form of trying to pick up those back legs, she was just a no-go and she was squeal and kick. And um, after about three months of doing this, um, just no expectations being together, um, I went to go um, attempt to pick up her back leg and I was able to just run my hand all the way down her back leg. She didn't make any response. She was totally chill, pick up her back leg without any issues. And so wow. we never directly addressed 
the, the, the misbehavior of kicking when I tried to pick up her back feet. <laughs> you know? She's off the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Through this approach of uh, just concentrating on engaging that social connection and being together, all of a sudden these other behavioral issues started to just dissipate and weren't right. an issue anymore because now we actually had a connection where she trusted me. Right, right. And so then from that point I was like, okay, there has to be... There has to be another way that's in line with this kind of way of thinking. And so, again, I made the commitment that I wasn't going to do any training until I could find, now that I knew that something was working and I knew that there had to be other people that have discovered a similar thing, that if you could just engage that social connection, that you mm. can do anything with the horse as long as it trusts you. You don't need to actually address specific behavioral issues. And, uh, and then that was when I came across the positive reinforcement and clicker training. Because in a couple of minutes you're going to show us some of the things that you, you're able to do with her now. Mm -hmm. And so what are you going to show us Show us that she can do? Um, well, I guess in line with that story, one of the things that she's super good at now is picking up her feet. Okay. Um, and so I just have to do a simple run my hand down her leg and mm -hmm. just say leg up. And she'll pick both the front wow. and the back ones up and she doesn't have any issues with that. Um, so she's come a very long way with that. And um, a lot of what I've taught her is um, things that just sort of allow for... Um, easy care and management of her, so what we'd call cooperative care tasks. Uh, you know, if I need her to just sort of shift her position or, um, you know, get her off a certain leg, then I can just point to a leg and she'll lift it up. Oh, wow. Um, or obviously I can get her to lead without making any contact with her uh -huh. um, and back up just with a touch on her face and, um, yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> and then some fun stuff too. <laughs> so as a result of that and recognising that, that, um, that, uh, lots of people have difficult um, situations mm. or, or they just want to train a horse a better way. You've started a little business, right? Yes. Yeah. So what do you call that? Um, so it's Liberated Equestrian Horsemanship. Liberated Equestrian Horsemanship. Yes. Yep. So it's based on the idea of uh, if we can liberate the equestrian or the, the owner from these false beliefs of, um, of traditional training, then um, through that we can liberate the horse. Right. And I said business, but that's probably not fair. You, you um, recognize there are people out there that want help and you think, feel like you can give them help mm, yes. and they um, want to love their horses effectively and you want to yes. be able to do that. Obviously, if you're doing it, you've got to make some money out of it so that you can actually keep doing it. <laughs> yes. But the motivation isn't a business. The motivation is to actually get the word out on how yeah, to actually love absolutely. and care for, care for horses. I think, for there, I think there are a lot of people who have just the best intentions with their horses and they want um, you know, they'll say they buy for their horse and they mm. want to have that love and that bond and um, but because of an industry that's that's just over flooded with so many misconceptions, um, the people so many people get led um, astray and they end up forming what they think is um, a social connection but because of how the mammalian brain is designed to uh, cope with trauma, a lot of these connections that get formed, um, it seems like the horse is a willing partner, um, but it's because, you know, the brain does things like frozen watchfulness oh and condition suppression God. where, um, you know, it appears as if they're there willingly, but it's just, it's the nervous system and the brain coping with the trauma in a way that, right. I mean, you know, traumatized brains make traumatized decisions. Right. And um. All right, well, let's go and, and see some of the things and you'll see how, um, I'm sure we'll see how happy um, Ari is in, in this process. But you have a website too, what's it called? Uh, so just www.liberatedquestrianhorsemanship.com. And I'll put that in, a link in, in the description of the YouTube as well. Um, well, thanks, sweetie. I, I, I'm so proud of you. I love you so much. I, I'm so grateful that you found this this space to, to be in. And I'm really thankful that you spent the time with me today to try to share it with me. Because to me, this is the application. These are the spaces when you start seeing the world in terms of love and worth. You, you find lots and lots of applications. And you're showing me there's even more than what I, I had um, anticipated. So this has been a really wonderful time and a, and a wonderful day. So thank you so much. Definitely and let's go and see you. Ari do her thing. Yes.
Oh, okay. She's like lifts one leg and puts her head down. But she's only... She only started offering it this morning. So. Now this is another one of her newer tricks that she's been working on. She's beautiful, isn't she? So how long have you been working with her to try and get her to... Well, um, about like maybe 10 months all up, but there was about like six months in there which when I first moved here and I didn't do anything. Right, right. So. Right. All right, well, that's, that was very good, Ari. You did a great job. Very proud of you.